Hey folks, happy uh, weekend. It's the 1st of June, 2025, and this is going to be quick. I just want to give a little bit of a table setting to what you're going to see below in this email. Simply two, uh, two links, one in which was uh, an announcement last week. It was a press release that was put out um, by a group in Washington, D.C. called SOA is their acronym, Special Operations Association of America, and their website being SOA.org. Um, they had announced me as a, a, an addition to their board of advisors around the big issue that our country is facing with critical mineral supply chain, uh, real problems that we're foreseeing uh, now that China has cut us off. And this has got all the way to the top in DC circles, I can tell you that. And even when you have, you know, special operations folks that I've had discussions with uh, numerous uh, people that are, you know, in charge of and leading large groups of special ops that are still active. And when breaking down some of the statistics on the issues with things like antimony, uh, vanadium, um, gallium, tungsten, uh, dysprosium, uh, you know, the magnet metals, all of these different things that we're seeing are going to become uh, problems for us to produce actual technology and products that can literally secure the country, can defend the country. Also, with regard to our energy needs with the battery metals, uh, we've gone to a point where it's uncogitable that we've allowed over in most cases of critical minerals and rare earth metals, there's some overlap there, but it's a technicality. Uh, you know, China is controlling in very many cases, like 80% plus, maybe even 90, where they control when it comes down to the production and processing of specialty minerals, over 85% of the global uh, supply chain. They've cut us off on several that are really clear indications that this was a retaliation for us cutting off their ability to get semiconductor chips on the highest level of power from uh, NVIDIA last year when they stopped any exports. And it's not just the US, they're stopping exports on these for anybody, which is gallium, which you need for uh, semiconductors. Uh, and that's one that they threw in there, which I think is a clear part of that message, antimony, which is a munitions uh, metal, flame retardant, and many applications that you need in ammunition and, and basically uh, go into war. And, um, and then we also had, I believe it was uh, germanium. So this is very interesting what's happening. And even with some level of diplomacy coming to the rescue, which it's very unclear whether that's going to be the case. China has been preparing to have uh, the world, particularly the West, in a stranglehold with these critical minerals for, I think, over 25 years. And they've been doing it methodically and uh, specifically, you know, whatever the economic benefits are for them. I don't think that they're uh, that because these are not massive markets, but it's a strategic, actually active pretty much war at, at this stage. So I'm all for peace and I'm all for um, and rectifying that however we can to make sure that we can make what we need and the world needs to make what they need to live a peaceful life. But in the case of the United States and the mining sector, we have really made some big errors in undercapitalizing this space. This situation, I just wanted to share this announcement because Part of uh, the dialogue that I've had with uh, folks like Daniel Elkins, the founder of SOA, who's quoted in the article, and other folks with SOA, and it'll just get more engaged from here because it's now an official uh, role, is just you know sharing what I see and what we've seen and what we've done in financing a lot of these companies that are doing work on U.S. soil that have rare earth elements and antimony and critical minerals of various sorts right here in the US. But the shocker is typically that when you look at the time it takes to go from a discovery, really in any sort of a, a, a natural resource, we're really in metals, to when you're going to be able to produce that actual raw material and bring it out of the ground 
on average, if you're being kind, it's it's about 15 years. So even if you have an acceleration of capital, we've got some real challenges ahead uh, in the next three years, I mean, or less. There's no antimony. You can't get it anywhere. I just spoke to the largest lithium producer. He's a, uh, a, a new uh, ad to that company. Um, and this is the largest lithium producer in the U.S. So they're a large corporation and they have particular products with a lithium subset that need antimony to ramp up their production and they can't find it. It's just the same thing like with U.S. antimony, which is the one active smelter in the United States. Their problem is, well, yes, they've also got a capacity issue. They're working on that with with engineers and it's really bringing a lot of attention and capital to what they're doing. But, you know, the problem is, is where are they getting the raw materials from? You know, so we've got this issue with things like floor spar and the list can go on and on and on. And we have our own interests, like, for example, Phenom Resources. You know, uh, I'm a huge, you know, this is the gold investment letter, but we also have the largest, uh, highest grade vanadium asset in North America, a processing technology with patented technology that is potentially very fundable from um, a government perspective to get that processing technology where you're going to have V205 production. It, it could be as little as two and a half years. So you're not talking about a five year ramp up on a mine build, which, you know, Carlin, you know, as of now with uh, the last PEA, which I believe will get improved upon as we go into pre-fees and things of that nature, which will happen when you get a, a move in the vanadium price when it's appropriate. But, um, you know, these grants and the things that the government has been giving out, the processing project, I was very excited about it last year. As a lot of you guys know, I thought we were about to get a deal uh, with a, a huge organization to put up the risk capital, a large amount of that. Uh, to start to de-risk it. We've been de-risking it on our own, and it is an extremely viable way to look at uh, vanadium production where instead of you know, 400, $400 million capex to build the Carlin mine, which by the way, you know, Phenom's an exploration company. A lot of these companies are exploration companies that we go into. It doesn't necessarily mean that the people involved are really capable and or uh, qualified to then build and run a mine. So, you know, that's where we look at sort of, you know, divestitures and M&A opportunities where you can just get paid for taking it to a certain point, give it off to the folks that can do it properly. On the metallurgical side and on the uh, processing side of things, we've got an all-star team at Phenom that's very capable of pulling that off. And so, you know, things like that are going to be in the mix for various uh, potential funding and streamlining because we need to. You know, you need to do that. So I think, and I'm I'm very clear with the folks uh, that I'm talking to when I've got, you know, when I've got uh, personal interest and exposure, I don't want any conflicts or whatever, but I'm also not going to avoid talking about the things that I think are most compelling to get some of these solutions to the problems just because I have a share position. Um, you know, I'm not rich enough to just sell all of this stuff and then say, I'm going to give all the best ideas to the government and, you know, not capitalize myself uh but you know what it, it, it's all going to be their decision but at the end of the day it's about education it's about pointing to other experts that i know in the space and being able to connect people to get capital flowing this includes cutting red tape on permitting across the u.s i also have an initiative uh one of the big things that i'm going to be a proponent of is a capital gains tax moratorium for u.s uh, taxpayers that invest in any sort of public or private mining project that is working on U.S. soil uh, so that, you know, there's incentives on the tax side. We, we need that. You know, President Trump is very, very uh, big and proud of the fact that he saved the steel, steel industry. But you have to go further. You have to go under the ground. Where are we going to get? I mean, you've got I don't think you have issues with iron ore imports, but, you know, the things you need to make stainless steel like vanadium, where is this all going to come from? If you want to have an expanding uh, domestic manufacturing sector, you have to go further. We have got to start investing major capital and allow the private markets to expedite putting money into the ground. This could and this situation is not just based on like, you know, some of the headlines that we've seen in the last six months about this. 
you know, I think if anything, now it's sort of fizzled a little bit. And I'm just seeing that behind the scenes, this has got legs. This is not going away. And this could be um, a, a real catalyst for some of the mining companies that we own. We've got a drill program coming up with Batalis in Idaho, which is showing very, very high grade, you know, Stibnite samples from last year's field program, which is antimony. Um, and then even International Tower Hill, which I'm going to have a couple at least reports of research that I'm going to be releasing this next week to share with you more details about why that's a stock that is now my uh, largest, well, I would call it a pure play gold play, but now we know that from their pre-feasibility, they have millions of tons of antimony that they're now doing work on and why that is uh, to be one of the biggest no brainers to put a, a significant bet on and just with the gold price where it is, there are 21 million ounces of gold resource in Alaska. You know, that deal's got incredible upside. And I'm going to start to write so that you can just, instead of hearing me talk about it, uh, you'll see it in more of a traditional uh, outline of fundamental research and showing the different scenarios, including technicals, obviously, with, you know, certain areas that the stock could end up going. And they're all very, 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 very significantly higher than where we closed last week. In any event, uh, just if you guys, you know, if this is a, a matter close to your heart, even if you're Canadian, the thing is, is that we have this dialogue where, you know, the tariff bullshit that has come up you know, between Canada and the U.S. and caused these rifts, just know that I am making it extremely clear to anybody that I'm talking with that, you know, we need Canadian uh, corporations and the capitalization that has come historically over the last, you know, call it 20 or 45 years. Um, we've had more than half of all funding for mining companies and projects has come through the Canadian exchanges. We have these, uh, you know, proxies in the U.S., which are on the OTC and the pink sheets and all these other things that you can get exposure to those companies. My whole contention is, you know, it doesn't matter where the corporation is based. If they're going to do work on U.S. soil to develop, you know, what will be U.S. jobs and expediting potential discoveries, development, and then eventual mine and production of raw materials and strategic minerals, that it just isn't going to matter. And I don't think it will. So you have to see through the headlines. That's not if you're Canadian and you think this is an important issue, if you're American or wherever, if you want to see this. Uh, with a group of people that are very capable of actually impacting policy at the highest level in D.C., go to SOA's uh, 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 website. In fact, um, my foundation, we had committed to a $50,000 match of donations last week. They, they've they basically raised that, and it was in, in uh, effect until yesterday because I'm slow in getting this out to you guys that that active donation uh, program is going to be going until at least Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. So if you'd like to support them, I mean, I know these guys, there's, you know, the, everything that they do is for helping in the betterment of, I mean, even things like brain health with a lot of the vets and the special ops folks that come back, which is also an area that's of great interest to me that I hope to continue to work with them on that as well. But you know, they see these problems and they want to fix them. And any of the capital that ends up going into their nonprofit, which is a 501c19, which is a unique uh, structured nonprofit organization, unlike my foundation, a 501c3, where we're capped. And I just learned this, you know, this year talking with these guys is that we're capped at, I believe it's 10% of any donor capital to actually go towards lobbying or policy impact in DC. You've got a, you've got a, a very uh, a strong leash there on how much you can actually deploy, but they are created with uh, this, this formulation of 501c19 to impact policy specifically. And these guys are entrenched. Um, the folks I met, you know, inauguration weekend and continue to, to see, look at the, look at the board. Uh, of advisors. You know, you have the last Secretary of Defense um, under Trump's last uh, can't, last run in the White House. You have other folks that, I mean, these these are the cream of the crop and they, they get shit done. So if you'd like to support them, I would encourage you to go to SOA.org 
and donate. You know, I just did. And um, and I will continue to support them financially and do whatever I can just to help, you know, people understand the issues that we've got and potential solutions to make sure that we are okay in the future. So thanks, guys. Cheers.